Um, well, look, I'm going to turn things over to Casey. Um, I'll just welcome our attendees and remind everyone we are recording this session so that others who can't make it right now can view it in the remainder of the festival. So, um, Casey, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Neil, and and thanks to our special guests here. So uh, I guess I will say welcome to the Spokane Jewish Cultural Film Festival. Um, my name is Casey Andrews, and I'm a professor of English at Whitworth University in Spokane, and I also teach a lot of film studies classes. So this is a real delight to get to talk with, with you both here tonight. Um, and thanks uh, especially to Neil uh, for inviting me uh, and uh, to the Spokane Area Jewish Family Services for this festival uh, and this invitation. Um, Neil and I are friends for uh, quite a while now, and um, cinephiles who get these rare opportunities sometimes to check in about all the movies we've been watching, but this feels like a nice extension of some of that connection that Neil and I have, so I appreciate this offer to be involved, and uh, grateful so much to Benjamin Goldman and Daniel Gomberg for being here to talk about Eight Nights, which is just such a rich and interesting and fun and engaging film in so many ways, and I'm hopeful with our small gathering here that there might be a chance for some good conversation altogether about this. Um, so what I will um, do in a minute is just um, invite you two to say a short introduction to, uh, for yourselves. Um, and then I've got uh, a couple of leading questions I thought we could start with. And then I'll see what the, the room has to offer. And then I have a few backups that we could keep going on with. So, so Benjamin and Daniel, if you'd like to just to say uh, a little bit about where are you located at the moment? I'm always interested. Where are people zooming in from uh, at this point and where are you based? And, and then how do you at this moment describe yourselves professionally? Well, first, thank you, Casey and Neil, so much. It's like a, such a treat. I know Daniel can probably say it in much better words that are his, but I'll say a treat for us to be in this venue, to be with you. It's like it's the film isn't complete until it's received by real people and that uh, we can talk about it, whether, you know, whatever the reactions are is like um, it, it means so much, especially in this world where so often we just put these little messages in bottles of the of the Internet. Um, to have actual um, experience with people is, is everything. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'm in Santa Monica. Daniel is in uh, Highland like Park, L LA. Uh, 12 miles away from you, <laughs> to be precise. And 12 mile miles away. And during most of COVID, I saw him mostly over Zoom. And during about half of the production of Eight Nights, uh, it was it was just like this, but maybe a little less um, shaving and bathing and stuff. <laughs> it's good to know, Benj. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, I I'm actually if you look at my background, um, it's actually kind of the look background where we actually filmed it. It's right here. You guys are kind of watching this. The, you're seeing me in the same place, basically where I sat when we did the interview. Um, and, uh, yeah, Benji and I have known each other since, since two, 1996, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So yeah. it's been a long time. So just as a precursor, a lot of the reason the film got made was because of the history Benjamin and I have together over the many years. So that's something that I, I feel like needs to be uh expressed to everybody who watched the film that we we kind of are uh, connected in a, in a very long long history um and what was what, what else was i supposed to talk about i tried to keep it a little <laughs> open but how do you describe yourself professionally as oh, as oh yes yes yeah. yes <laughs> professionally well, I, right that part <laughs> um I, well, i'm also a cinephile you know i studied film at san francisco san francisco state university i studied film history and aesthetics and then i um uh i then i went on to study production and got my master's in production but my background is very much in documentary filmmaking so um and i've always been interested in sort of this um uh, this gray this sort of fuzzy line between documentary and narrative where you're telling a story but at the same time it is colored and by your memory memories aren't perfect which brings us into this kind of approach that Benjamin and I took with this project. Uh, how do you bring memories to life? You know, so, um, but I, I have, I have my own production company in Los Angeles. I do commercial work, documentary work. I'm, 
I, I, I work from home. Um, and the thing that we, Benjamin and I created is something that comes from the heart um, that we felt we wanted to share with people, which is why it's so wonderful to actually be able to talk to people like you and, and share this experience because we felt like it's something that I think a lot of people go through, but, but there's no way to really express it, you know? So that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I also studied documentary back in undergrad um, at Hampshire College, um, small liberal arts school um, that was a, a wonderful place to um, uh, explore. You made up your own majors and mine was um, animated documentary. Um, so my first big experiment with film was uh, taking audio recordings of my grandparents uh, conversations that we we'd had while looking at uh, a box of old photographs, and then making a, a stop motion animation to to recreate our conversation. Which, um, with all the things you could do with animation, I mean, you could be on other planets at a molecular level. Like for me, what was interesting was the time that I spent with my grandparents in their in their uh, assisted living facility. Um, after just having moved there from their home of 50 years. And um, so I've always had, you know, an interest in animation, but more so in what connects us. And animation is an art form and art is a way to uh, express emotions and uh, suggest connections. Um, but since that, <laughs> that ancient history, I went on to do um, short animations for the History Channel, a and &E, and uh, title sequences, feature film title sequences, um, work on, on IMAX documentaries. Um, and now I'm, uh, among other things, trying to do a, um, a children's show. It's um, stories for children and the adults who love them. And um, it's it's uh, part animated, part live action, and comes from uh, my feeling that th this world is uh, so chaotic, feels so chaotic, and I will soon be a father, and I want to be putting stories out there that that help uh, help maybe help heal or just help feel. Um, in this in this tumultuous world. Wow, yeah, there's a lot for us to keep digging into in all this, that's great. Um, I wanted to maybe just start with um, a couple of different origin stories you all could tell. So uh, you began this, uh, Daniel saying that you have known each other since 1996. I wanted to ask this question of how long have you been collaborating? How did it begin? Where did this uh, origin of your partnership come from? Bench? <laughs> oh, where did the origin of our partnership come from? Origin. Just kind of give, give us some backstory, yeah. I guess, on your, well, your working relationship. I mean, yeah. I guess we could tell it in two different ways. One <laughs> is that we met in an, an insane asylum, and the other is that we met in um, a nursing home, both of which are, are, are true, but um, it was for a film that Daniel was producing in Vancouver, and it was a shoot that was split between a... Um, uh, old mental institution that had been turned into like movie studios. The X-Files was shooting there and different independent films would rent space in this creepy old place. Um, and, and in Daniel's production, they had built a living room inside an insane asylum to shoot half of the film. And the other half was shot in um, a nursing home. And um, that, that was functional and there were residents there and Daniel was having trouble finding a, a sound recordist. So we had a friend in common who knew that I wore lots of different hats and they flew me out to record sound in this nursing home where the director of the film was kind of a maniac and he was like grabbing people in wheelchairs and pushing them around and trying to get a better shot and I was mortified and Daniel was mortified and he looked at me, he said, we should, we should be making documentaries about their lives, not pushing them around like they're props. And so that was kind of the beginning of our friendship in 1996 that we saw each other in that moment and then um, in the production and then we kept bumping into each other at film festivals showing our respective grandparent films. Mine was animated and his was 
live action with uh, with his grandparents. Um, but we kept bumping into each other at film festivals. And then um, at some point, I moved to LA to go to CalArts and Daniel moved to LA to uh, work in the business. And um, we started working together on uh, independent projects and, and paid gigs whenever we could. We actually were working on our grandparents, films about our grandparents, respectively at the same time when we actually met at the on the shoot and we actually talked like i'm doing a documentary with my grandparents and bench was like well i i just I, that's what i'm working on now and so and here we are at an old age home and you know we shouldn't be pushing these people around we should be filming them instead of a 35 millimeter camera we should be using a 16 millimeter camera so we can walk around and not be you know encumbered by this big camera you know and so that's how we connected that's great. Yeah. All right. So then how about the origin just of Eight Nights? Can you talk us through a little of the, the backstory of the production of that? And I don't know if this is part of this, but I'm very curious about how does it become part of The New Yorker? So all of that. Um, well, I, I, I wrote a, um, I started working on a, uh, The Moth. And if we could go back, I don't know if you know The Moth. And I took a workshop uh, and thought that, you know, and my teacher said, you know, you should tell a story that that you're embarrassed about telling. <laughs> you don't you don't want to tell anybody. You should like bury your soul because that's what people want to hear. And I and I started sort of writing it and I wrote it out. And then I I showed it to Benjamin for for his thoughts, you know, and his feedback. And he was like, Oh, I remember that time. <laughs> wow, you know, maybe this is something we should we should work on, you know. And we continue the conversation about it. And then um, I think right before COVID, um, we, th we, we discussed about making something that is personal to us, that doesn't take up a lot of, doesn't have to have crew, you know, a lot of crew. Um, and that's when the, the, then we said, let's just do it. Let's not talk about it anymore. Let's just dig in and I don't know, Benjamin was going through some diff tough times and I, I said, let's just, let's just do it. Come on over, you know, I'll set up the camera. We'll just do it. And um, Benjamin came over and we started putting up the lights and he kind of forgot whatever troubles he was having and, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and full, fully in, um, engaged in my troubles, you know, like, fully engaged in my problem and said, Daniel, no, we should really get this stuff out. And like, you know, yeah, you can laugh at it, but why don't we just go seriously into it and, and see if we can take the laughter out and just go for the serious stuff. And so, I mean, that's my experience. I don't you know. We all have different experiences in production, but I felt like Benjamin was pushing me to dig for the, for the stuff that wasn't like, didn't make me embarrassed like it embarrassed me but when i go to an embarrassing place i start like making a joke i mean uh, i love that i could push you and it, to me it, it it's it's similar but but slightly different in the origin of this which is that uh years before that i i kept getting these um facetime calls and photos from daniel wearing a silver spandex suit trying to explain to me what was going on and it was like my brain, I couldn't compute. Like I, is this, was it a joke? You know, was this like, I didn't, I couldn't wrap my my head around what uh, what was happening in the production and what Daniel's place in it was and, and why Daniel was doing it. And, you know, he had mixed feelings. I mean, I think when you watch the film, it's like, you know, you have this, we have this perfect hindsight. We, we, we per, you know crafted our message so carefully, but in the moment, it's like this: so many different feelings um, coming at the same time, like like life, you know. And that there is a kind of laughter. Uh, is it nervous laughter? Is it um, gallows humor? Is it you know? Are we laughing to get through something painful? Well, not really, because the pain festers. You know, like at first, it's just this nervous laughter because. Um, I don't know, like the kind of laughter that I had as a as a kid in a funeral, not because it was funny, but because I didn't know how to be. And 
when you know fast forward a few decades and and Daniel is sharing the story of of of, of this experience of his life and he he you know the camera's rolling and and he's saying something and, and laughing as he's saying it I, I wanted to tease that apart and I wanted to see you know what is it you know that that causes that uh mm -hmm. unease you know what what are the the aspects of it um and I really you know had some hunches but didn't know and just felt like Daniel and I knew each other well enough and trusted each other well enough that we could sort of um try uh different ways to express a story that Daniel had um lived with and thought about and and expressed so many different ways and I still didn't understand it I still didn't understand why he stayed for all of the whole production because I could only see it through my experience you know and I'm a little more I think uh quick to anger than than Daniel is um, he's probably more perspicacious and and is able to, you know, weigh things in a way that I do after the fact, wishing that I would have been more tactful or, or something. But um, so I think in that balance of the way we're wired, we created this third ex thing, this this expression that neither of us could have made on our own. That question about why you stayed, it, it seems a little unresolved in the film itself. Maybe I'm missing the piece, but it, it, it's, it does leave it unsettled. I wonder, do you get asked about this a lot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very simple reason. I mean, I'm a, I was a SAG actor. I, I signed a contract and um, they went through my agent. So to say no to them for the rest of the seven days and then them having to find someone else would have kind of marked me as don't work with this guy and it was for NBC so I was like ah eh. you know like I didn't quite know what I got myself into because they when I when I called them they didn't tell me what it was in, in, as you know in the in the short they they didn't they said no we can't disclose it it's an NDA so you have to just show up and by the time I show up and I get into the suit and, you know that's the sh that's the short uh, and for me it. it's like the the ambiguity is is kind of important i think you're right it is ambiguous um yeah. and and people bring their life experience to that question and so um for me it was sort of like the the the, the idea of paying your dues of of being of there being this existent power dynamic um of of wanting of, of being a hopeful person you know, like all of that is is wrapped into the decision to stay, and and without the hindsight of how this is going to land, you know, of what it's actually going to feel like to be on your, you know, to have your family say, "Wow, that was a thing, what you just did," mm -hmm. you know, like it it was, you know, time is a little condensed in the five and a half minute film but in real life it took some time between when daniel went through this and when his family was able to you know mm -hmm. sit with it so i don't know i, I mean I, I don't think that that's actually an answer to a question um neil well, but I, I i think it or casey but it is um it's a color, <laughs> a color i mean they, they did ask me to come back the next for the next two years they kept calling me and i said no thank you i'm busy you know but um yeah i mean it it it, it, it was hard for my, fa my my family did not want to acknowledge that it happened like nobody in my family ever talked about it uh, since I, it happened yeah i have i have several more of these kind of i'm interested more in these thematic elements of the film i had some general questions too I, i'll stick with this one specific one just because you brought it up but it does seem like the film seems to parallel a little bit of the experiences in russia and then the the NBC power structures and Conan O'Brien. I don't know how much you're leaning on that parallelism, but it definitely resonates as different kinds of bullying. If that's an okay way to talk about that, of course. I mean, look what's happening right now yeah. <laughs> with Russia. I mean, yeah. I mean, the thing that I feel like 
we worked really hard at, and, and Benjamin kind of helped tease this out, was that the without my experience growing up as a Jew who doesn't know what Judaism is in the Soviet Union, back then it was the Soviet Union, um, the impactfulness of the story wouldn't really be there, you know, like, because it was a, a double whammy, you know, it was like, I didn't know who I was when I was there, and I learned who I am, and connected with that, and then I betrayed it with this event. And so it really um, has a very complex emotional kind of um, through line in the story. Like, I, mean, I talk to my dad almost every day, you know, like, literally, I talk to him today, you know, about what's happening in Russia. And, and um, you can't take that experience that we had in, in Russia as, as, as a Jew out of my experience and idea of what America is to me. Like, you know, so Benj and I, Benj kind of gets my uh, perspective of an outsider. And, and even today, Benjamin's like, Daniel, what do you think about what's happening in Russia? You know, like from my knowledge of that culture. So, yeah, I mean, it's complex. It, you, can't, you can't just d d separate the two. But I think that thing you just you were picking up on or, or mentioning is that um, the, the outsider feeling of, you know, being in, in Russia and that um, for you to have a future there, your parents would have to bribe your way into schools and you would have to um, sort of hide um, the, the trappings of being Jewish to, to make your way. And that then again, on the Conan O'Brien show, you literally have to hide your face and uh, pretend like um, there is no meaning in what you're doing to, to get along, to, to make it in the industry, to pay your dues so you can get <clears throat> better roles. Um, so I don't know, it's, I'm, I'm wary of saying, you know, that it's sort of a, you know, I think there's, it, it's so loaded these days when you, when you look at what people do for, a, for a laugh or for, you know, satire or to express themselves. And um, I think we look at it all through our um, 2022 vision, <laughs> um, which says that what Conan did was absolutely wrong. Um, and, and when I think about it, it's like, yes, that's true. And also what's true is that we as a, a, a community of watchers are insatiable and you have a room full of people who are doing everything they can to top what they did last week or last night. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we, I say we as in humans have invited um, more, bigger, faster, louder, bodier in our appetite for this. So I don't know, it's hard to, you know, like when I, when I saw something about Mary, I didn't think, oh no, what's happening to, to comedy? I thought that is hilarious. That like all the stuff that I thought about or was scared about or whatever with, you know, dating or what, like, wow, they showed it on camera. It's like the zipper scene, you know, will never leave me because it was part of my unconscious fear growing up. So I, you know, like, I don't know. I, I think it's it's fun fun to think about the evolution of comedy. Um, I think there's a risk in looking at what people have done over the years and, you know, like, doing this, but then there's also the reality of how media has been used to uh, create violence. You know, I took this class in undergrad called Jews in Germany, and it was like, you know, the violence against the Jews started with comparing them to rats. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, there were films that did that very eloquently at the time across Dissolve between Jews leaving the synagogue and, and, and rats leaving the sewers 
played on the minds of, of people who'd never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really know how to feel about how to feel about what Conan did. Um, I, I'm just interested in that uh, our insatiable appetite for um, entertainment, which um, drives and pays for the writer's room that that pitches jokes like this. I mean, don't forget that Sarah Silverman came out uh, on one of the episodes and fed latkes to the head of the of the centipede, right? Yeah. So like, and you know, and then she's writing articles today about why is it that they're not casting Jews to play Jewish roles? And I'm like, whoa, that's a quick switch. <laughs> and it's, you know, I, I, I love Sarah Silverman. I feel like she's had an evolution as a comedian and a philosopher. And, you know, she's really kind of uh, owning pain that she's caused in a way, you know, it's, it, it's really interesting to see her talk about um, things that she did uh, 10, even five years ago that she does not stand behind, you know? So there is sort of an evolution, um, but yeah, there's, there are also problems. So much of the, the Conan O'Brien uh, shtick, I guess, the, the kind of um, way that he does comedy is absurdism. And he's very vocal about saying, I don't want to do pointedly political comedy in the kind of Jon Stewart style or something like that. It is just interesting that I find your response, in essence, in this piece is if it had just been, as you said, Benjamin, you know, finger wagging, that would be one kind of um, current cultural way of saying Conan failed a certain purity test about whether this is acceptable comedy or not. Your approach, I think, because of how humorously you handle some elements, ends up having a kind of more gentle criticism that engages. And I, I was kind of curious to know how conscious you are about using the lightness of touch in certain ways in your piece as a way to name some of what could otherwise be simply scolding or taking to task someone for an anti-Semitic kind of um, performance. Um, do you, do you wow. see what I'm getting at with this I question? I do, and I really, I really appreciate that question. And it reminds me of um, a coffee that I had with my cousin, who's a rabbi, and I was telling him about what Daniel and I were working on. <laughs> and he started telling me about, um, I think it was a certain menorah that um, depicted um, a certain scene where um, this character from the Old Testament, who I can't remember, I'm going to get this all wrong, but she um, she cut off someone's head and held it aloft, and that that was sort of the theme of this certain menorah that was picking up on that sort of um, you know vigilante justice, and that 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 what my cousin, what, what came up for him, from him, for him when I told him what we were doing was that, that Daniel should, you know, get up from his hands and he's rip himself free, you know, grab Conan's head and like cut his head off with a sword, you know, like for him, that was the, the happy ending was that there's justice, you know. The Maccabees. <laughs> right, yeah. But for me, it was like, it, it is very much, I think the way I speak about it in, circles and each circle maybe takes a little bit more and leaves a little behind and somehow it's just suggesting that this is a conundrum. So the um, sort of gentle touch comes from uh, sensitivity to the multiple perspectives on any given experience, you know. So I think um, there are certain things we know and certain things we guess um, and certain things that, um, you know, it's like, it's very hard to say anything with, with surety <laughs> when it comes to, um, anything but our own experience. And so I aim to support Daniel in sharing how he felt about this experience right. more than, uh, saying that Conan did or did not uh, do something wrong. Um, so I think that's probably in essence where the gentle touch comes from is that feelings are complex 
things. Um, and that I didn't want those complex things to be overshadowed by um, uh, a resolute message about, you know, uh, how you too can help prevent comedy from becoming too whatever, you know, like I just wanted to keep it in that place of like, you know, my friend who has this uh, rich history, family history that informs his everyday life that would have been my history if my great grandparents didn't leave earlier. You know, so so I've always felt connected to Daniel in that way that he's sort of uh, lived directly what I've heard echoes of, um, and wanted to give more space for that than you know, kind of what, what Conan was doing. Dan, did you have anything an, you wanted to add? Well, there's an appeal to uh, one thing that we always kind of talk, try to, to talk about is the fact that the film is not about. Conan. It's about me going through these feelings. And I think that, yes, that, that visceral reaction, how dare he do this horrific thing? You know, aren't we all angry? Um, I think Benjamin's approach to something that is, looks wrong is to appeal to the emotion, to unpack the emotion rather than to act it out. You know, so if you unpack the emotion and you explain it and you in, in an in, as an appeal, an emotional appeal to someone, it, you cannot help but listen to them versus just reacting uh, as a reactionary thing. So I, I think that's constantly the work, you know, that's the work of of of, of in the writing or telling a story is you're always appealing to the emotional value of each event rather than reacting to the thing that you're angry at. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, just my version of what Benjamin was trying, I think, trying to express. Yeah, this is, this is great. And I have plenty more to talk with you all about, but I'm wondering if we should see if there are questions from the gathered crowd here. Hi, Rosalind. Hi, Casey. So nice to see you. <laughs> see you too. Go ahead, Jim. This is not a question, but it's just a comment. But after hearing this discussion, uh, you're, you are making me think uh, more of what's happened to me in my life and the times I've had to hold my tongue as probably everybody else who's Jewish here you know, in some social situation. And, uh, you know, and, and now I'm thinking because of everything that's happening currently, yeah, am I gonna do that in the future or not? But um, anyway, so it, it's, it's a tough decision. So, yeah, so just a comment, not a question. Thank you for letting us know that, 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 that uh, the film made, made that effect on you. Yeah, I think it, it's it's definitely um, it definitely sits with with me too. That that you know I, I call it hindsight or twenty twenty two vision, but it's like um, how many things would we do differently if we had a chance to? Like Daniel, if you if you were offered this role again, which I guess you you were, you had the life experience to say, no, you know, enough is enough. Like, right. that's, it's not my, my thing. Um, but I think um, what, um, what you were talking about is in, in real life and everyday life, how, how um, we experience things that are, you know, just get a little bit closer to uncomfortable um, or dangerous or violent. You know, and that there is this uh, continuum, you know, that um, how do we navigate what is just someone blowing off steam and it's better to be, you know, left alone, don't add any fuel to the fire, and where are our efforts and, and our conversations um, really useful? A, a friend of mine is, um, he was, he's a marriage and family therapist, and when he was training to be American family therapist, we were walking down the street together in San Francisco 
And um, on, on the sidewalk was someone who was probably schizophrenic and needed to be on medication, but wasn't. And they were yelling at people who weren't there. And um, we crossed the, the street to the other side of the, the other sidewalk. And I said, Adam, what do you do when you encounter someone like that who, who clearly, you know, is so out of control? And he said, I crossed the street. And I kind of looked at him like, shouldn't you, your marriage, marriage and family therapist, like, shouldn't you know what to do? He's like, I crossed the street. Not every two people need to relate. Mm. You know, and it was like, that gave me a lot of peace because I, have this, you know, maybe sometimes disruptive empathy for everyone in existence. I'm, I'm feeling something if I let myself. And, um, you know, to know that, that um, there are some situations that I can just let go of and that others then get more of my attention and more of my love. And maybe it's a more useful conversation with people who you can actually um, find some com commonality with, and um, maybe that's a way to a approach it. I, I, I know you weren't asking how to do it. It's just something that came up for me is that it is, it is a conundrum for me too, that um, there's, there's so much that feels um, uh, wrong or like it's on a trajectory toward violence. And I had to leave Facebook because I've felt so much of what you're feeling. I couldn't, I couldn't get into these conversations with people, even cousins who um, were um, saying things that um, felt like they were the early steps that I learned about in the Jews in Germany of how you subjugate a people, of how you turn um, ideas into actions of violence. Um, so, yeah. I try to use the, if I, I totally agree with Ben, you know, walking away is a good way to like, sometimes you just can't, you, you can't have a conversation. But I have some friends who have very difficult, different views than I do, like very different views. Uh, um, and, and what I try to do is I, I would just say, why do you feel the way you feel? You know, like, why, tell me about your experience that makes you feel what you're feeling. And we have a conversation and I let them know why I feel the way I feel. And then I respect your feelings. I, did, I don't have to agree with them, but now we know why we feel the way we feel. And in a way, even though you're, you don't agree with that person, in a strange way, you can still feel a connection with them because you've just shared a, a why rather than a you know, an argument and, and a hatred towards one another. I love and I, that. And circling back to the film, uh, one, one, one of the ways that that um, applies directly to me is that um, in life, in my friendship with Daniel, I would always get frustrated when we were um, walking down the street uh, in a grocery store, in a movie theater, and his dad would FaceTime him and he would pick up in a movie theater. And it, it frustrated me to no end. And I'd asked him about it for years and I'd never gotten a straight answer. And so it was just something that, that um, annoyed me more. And, but as the years go by, it's just, you know, I love Daniel, but this thing annoys me about him. Um, <clears throat> but I never thought to ask, you know, basically the heart of what Daniel just said, you know, you and I do these things differently why do you suppose but when i could ask that and he could answer because i'm afraid it might be the last time i hear from them it's like he wasn't the one that needed to change i just needed to know what you know how he felt about what he was doing and and not go to movies with him <laughs> I mean, it's just so ingrained in my psyche that when your family calls, you answer the phone. Like, even in Russia back then, it's like, 
and and ben, as benjamin knows you know my, the story about my grandfather and leaving my grandmother at the train station and never seeing her again because he got lost and 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 they died in the camps and uh, so like that 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 generational thing had stayed had been transferred to me from my grandmother to my father from my father to me and and now i pick up the phone in the movie theater and bother benjamin about it <laughs> anyway yeah that is a that's a wonderful very powerful moment in the film i think that when that revelation comes up um that's that's really really wonderful um you're making me all think about some of um, the uh, in the family systems theory to say that you know when you're with your um, irritating family members or other people that trigger your emotions that one of the ways is not to disconnect but to stay connected but not allow your emotions to be wrapped up in their kind of difficulties and one of the ways that's often talked about is to act in those moments as though you're a journalist or i've heard it said act like a documentarian so i'm staying close i'm observing closely i'm not going to let myself get triggered in this but i'm not going to disconnect from it either and i i wonder do you do you accept that kind of notion of the documentarian as the staying close but not allowing yourself to be um, consumed by the emotions that you're observing yeah that's absolutely. fascinating i i think that that is a great thing to aspire to in, in life. And I, I find that I often fall short. Um, and, and maybe that is useful in, in art because there's so much that's a projection or transference or that, you know, you don't know where you stop and the subject starts. I mean, there are, you know, was it, uh, Errol Morris who talked about, um, asking a question and then not listening to the answer so that he could just let the subject, you know, go where they went. And then he, later in editing, he would find um, the story. Um, for me, it's like, I, I wish I could do that. I think I have the opposite approach, which is that, you know, I, I see you getting excited by a question, Casey, and it makes me excited about that question. And I want to know how we can come closer together around that question. So it's like we're co-creating this moment. Um, but when I'm talking to, you know, certain friends and family members, I do think about more like what you were saying and what Daniel was saying, which is um, how can you approach it as a documentarian, uh, as a journalist, um, as, uh, you know, the on. Um, the study of it, you know, you and I see things differently. Why do you suppose, you know, and then just waiting for an answer that I think takes, I, I would love to be able to do that more. I, I find myself getting wrapped up in the, the confusion of it a little bit more. Fascinating I because I actually, uh, I use, I, I I, I try to envision myself being a documentary filmmaker when I have an uh, 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 an argument, not an argument, but um, my neighbors are very, um, can be very difficult, you know, and they're very different from me. Um, uh, there's a lot of family strife on both houses right across from me. And, you know, drinking and fighting sometimes even. And um, whenever I go outside, and no matter who, who they are, I always say to them, I, I'm always polite. I would say hello. No matter, even if they don't say hello, I always say hello to them. And um, as the years have progressed, they are not afraid of me. They don't think of me as the different per They just think of me as a regular human being. And then when there is a problem, for example, our neighbor got really drunk and physical and i decided to not be quiet and close the blinds and turn off the lights which is what everybody else did in my neighborhood i actually turned on my lights opened the door walked across the street and said is everything okay can i help you and at that moment i was only thinking as a filmmaker <laughs> uh, i am making a movie i'm going to ask and engage myself with this human being and i'm going to ask if they need help and the minute i asked for that everything stopped and he turned to me and and he started to tell me what the problem was just as though i was asking him a normal question and in that moment uh the fighting stopped and 
the chaos stopped and he just started to talk. And I said, would you want to take a walk with me around the block? Let's just walk it off. And we took a walk and thank God everything was okay and no cops came. But I feel like that hat of putting on the documentary filmmaker hat and engaging someone in conversation, not being afraid, but just being inquisitive about what and why they're feeling what they're feeling. Turns out that the reason why he was upset and he was drunk was because nobody was listening to him and nobody wanted to, you know, him and his mother were having issues. But like, I use it as a survival skill almost in a way, being able to interview someone in a way where you don't judge them, but just listen to them. You know, if we, sh- if we just had more of that, geez, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you all know the film Camera Person, Kirsten Johnson's documentary Camera Person? Sounds familiar. Kirsten Johnson um, was uh, for 25 years uh, a cinematographer on documentary films, a lot of pretty well-known Pray the Devil Back to Hell and um, many, many films that you would recognize. And she then, um, after 25 years of doing this, directed her first film, which was she took elements that had been cut that from films she'd contributed to, the elements where, as she's listening to someone tell their story about things that had happened to their bodies in Bosnia, for instance, and she as the documentarian starts crying while she's filming and the camera shakes. And those are things that obviously are getting cut out of the documentary. She makes a film out of all of those moments Mm -hmm. where she enters and Benjamin, what you're saying and Daniel too, like that sense of, keeping the documentarian but also the empathy remaining such that you're not just coldly listening it's it's actually i think different than the errol morris of of kind of cutting out and only engaging later johnson saying i want myself to be present here for these people and i i need to tell a story in film of the times when my my body was present to them and it was not good for the film that was being made but it's good for this moment to reflect on later so Mm. i don't know if that's more just a footnote comment but camera person highly recommend that yeah just made my list thank you well i i it actually what you're saying is i I, something that i studied in film school there's this sherman's march there's there's a lot of films where it's like it's a symbiosis. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation between you and the person staying away and you can, it, you know, cameras, uh, uh, is, is object. It's not objective. It's subjective. It no matter where you point it, you're making a, you're making a point of view. You're making, you're saying you're making a statement. So, uh, reacting to someone speaking and engaging them is that dance, you know, like when Benjamin and I were working on eight nights, I was very worried that I wasn't giving Benjamin what he wanted. <laughs> like, I was like, well, oh, am I getting it right? I just Well, like... there, is, there is that element of when you're making a film with slash about a filmmaker, um, it, it, there's this extra challenge that he knows that there's going to be cutting that's happening and that he's going to be presented in one light or another and that um, there are so many you know choices and all of that. And so the first few um uh times that any of this was recorded i was upset that daniel was doing it so correctly yeah that daniel was so polished in his presentation of this and i was you know found a way to get under his uh skin or protection enough that he was a little um, uh, more present in telling me what happened. And so it, it's, you know, it's, it's funny because we think of it as a documentary, but it's also Performative. this selective presentation of memories, you know, which, you know, since we're talking about documentary, uh, documentary is slash is not a name, Trinity Minha. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> like, that's right. Like, Everything you frame, there's what's on the outside of the frame. When you cut, there's what's before and after the cut. Um, that she was you know, my teacher, by the way. she was. She was my teacher, by the way. Oh wow! <laughs> I know that. See, we're still learning. Um, but yeah, that that um, that feeling of like we know we have like all of this control over this thing that we're making because of this unique situation where we're filming in Daniel's dining room and. Um, then I'm going to animate everything around it. Um, how do we uh, keep the spirit of the expression alive, given that we have this complete digital 
reshootable documentary, you know. Daniel, you've frozen in a, in a very... <laughs> I thought it was just a pensive look, yeah. <laughs> so too. I have some more I would like to dig into, but do do any of our other audience participants have questions that they want to make sure they get out? Let's see if we get Daniel back. Uh, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> hey, there. I, you're back, but muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was great. You're fine. Uh, <laughs> I just I, I wanted to add something that I think what what Benjamin was trying to get me to do, well, I think, and that, Benjamin, you correct me if I'm wrong, is that is that thing that Ira Glass does so well in This American Life, which is, I think you, you know, you want to have the subject make a realization of something while they're actually talking about it, which is a very difficult thing to do. If you've already like scripted it and prepped it and you're like, it's perfect. So what Benjamin was trying to do was I think sometimes we would say, but that, but what really happened? But how did you really feel like? And I was like, well, let me think about that. And it's, I think that moment of thinking about it that um, where you kind of, oh, that aha moment uh, that, uh, that I think Benjamin was looking for in the process of putting this together, which is very difficult to do, by the way because you want the subject to have a revelation of something that they didn't know about in the moment. I mean, that was definitely part of it. But the other part was I wanted whoever saw this film to get you in the way that I got you, to have you, your presence in the way that I know you're present. Even right now, it's like the things you're saying to me, to all of us, I am receiving in a way that I wouldn't if you typed it up and right. put it on a teleprompter and set it to the camera. <laughs> so that that was also what I wanted was just the gift of of you. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So the film I I've seen it I think five times and every time I I forget that it's only five and a half minutes long because I think there's so much in there. It's so many tones and so many styles and yet never chaotic and there's a pacing to it that's wonderful. I am curious, uh, you, you didn't follow through fully on my asking about the relationship with the New Yorker and I am wondering, did you know this was a five and a half minute long piece? Did you trim down? I'm curious about just how did you achieve this kind of compression on this, this um, really rich work that is, is so concise? Well, part of it was just cutting out everything that didn't work. <laughs> no, but it really, it, it, it is this um, uh, trial and error. I mean, the, we always said the film will be as long as it needs to be, you know, and that, that um, we didn't um, want to, uh, to dwell in anything that, that was, um, it's a tricky thing because like, for instance, the first time I cut together um, the footage of the uh, Jews being loaded onto the trains, it was like, it was a real choice and it had a real impact to how we saw the whole film. And each time we saw it subsequently, we had become more used to seeing it. And we had, um, you know, uh, different, uh, associations and thoughts and and then and just the familiarity of it gave it a different impact so it's like the question becomes are you cutting for how you feel now or how you felt three weeks ago and um, I think there were times where we had to say to each other remember how this felt the first time we saw it remember you know um, why this is this way and it's amazing how you can go from being like, yes, this is perfect to no, 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 this, this isn't right to um, talking ourselves back almost like a time machine to the point where we were before we had seen it at all and then watching it again and, and getting that freshness back. And then you're like, okay, this is, this is going to be the experience of the film primarily is seeing it for the first time. And so doing that dance with, uh, watching something so many times that it it becomes something else, 
and um, recreating that that uh, freshness. Um, <laughs> there's there's this scene in it's in Pumping Iron where Arnold Schwarzenegger is talking about his uh, workout routine. And I don't know if I can say it without doing his accent. I'm going to try really hard because this is not, I'm, it's not, I'm not 12 years old anymore. <laughs> um, but he basically says, you have to shock your muscles like, you know, uh, biceps. You think I'm going to work you. I'm not going to work you. I'm going to work the quads or whatever, he, whatever it is. Um, so there is that kind of like, how do you surprise yourself with something you know so intimately and in doing that again and again um i think we we made something that that was getting um shorter and shorter um without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. um does that does that make sense it really does and i mean whatever is going on in your process is pretty incredible that that you um i mean maybe there's like a, a four hour cut of this that's also beautiful but um but this this five minute version it's just it it tells such a rich and complex story with this variety of textures but i'm never lost in the the various emotions that we've just been talking about throughout and the, the way the humor is laced in and doesn't rest uneasily in terms of tone um that blending of tone and, and tonal styles, and then also just the blending of filmic styles, which I know we've touched on already with your docu animation ideas. I think there's just so much that's happening in this as a as an art object. And um, I mean, we're we're kind of nearing the end, I suppose. And I just I did want to know, is there more work that, of this type that you're going into? I I'm I'm genuinely kind of curious about whether uh, this was a foray into the autobiographical and perhaps even the Jewish cultural identity expression that you're diving into. Uh, or uh, do you all have a feature in you? Is this is this um, uh, the kind of work that has um, more life that you could keep exploring? I'm curious about this. Well, uh, I, I've been sending, I, I, I sent Benjamin a short excerpt of my, uh, of a piece. I, I'm actually working on a memoir of, because there's a lot more story. I mean, Benjamin and I have been mining stories all for a while, but I mean, they're my, just my dad by himself. Is a, the first one we did was Daniel's dad's first experience with fire when he was a little boy in Riga, Latvia, that inspired him to become a combustion engineer, um, which is uh, is on our, our websites. We, we can send a link and a follow up. But yeah, we've, we've been uh, working on uh, family histories, films that mean something to us for, you know, um, and uh, we've written screenplays together that have ranged from uh, a linguist who goes to the Brazilian Amazon to, to study the Piraha. Um, and he goes there to convert them to Christianity. But in, in the end, they uh, in, convert him to living in the moment and not being concerned with um, the, the life to come. Um, so that's on one side of the spectrum. The other side is uh, Zach's therapy um, machine. Uh, Zach, yeah, the therapy. It's a machine. The, the whole setup is that instead of doing talk therapy, you go into a machine to do it, but it's really a container for us to talk about our families. So <laughs> and it takes the character back to his generation, Jewish struggle back to like the 1700s. <laughs> yeah, we, we, so, we went down the wormhole. We went down, I think yeah. The, it's a long uh, conversation, but the short answer is uh, we love working together. We have uh, features in mind. We have more family things in mind. And the challenge is always how do you um, balance this quirky vision with uh, the financial reality that films take time and money. And um, we've both found niches around the edges of the entertainment industry. Um, and so are always wondering how we would uh, do that last. I mean, we even we, we even wrote a, a, a an animated sitcom pilot. Yeah. Uh, about a Russian filmmaker who comes to America to make, you know, wants to make big Hollywood movies, but instead he makes crappy in, in industrial films using his family as cast and crew because he can't afford to hire anybody else. And kind of a little bit like my life, <laughs> you know, and the origins of him being thrown out of Russia because of Putin, who, uh, you know. But anyway, so the, yeah, wow. we, we've got lots. What's old of, is new. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, for one, am hopeful that there is more um, big projects coming from the both of you because this was just such an exciting piece to get to spend this time with. And I think we can all agree this has just been a lovely conversation with the two of you. I hope you found this to be a meaningful time with us. And um, uh, yeah, I'm just, just grateful for your sharing this time with us. And Neil, I don't know if there's anything else that you need to do officially uh, to close us out or if you want me just to say goodbye. <laughs> I, well, first of all, I have to say, I it's hard to express how much I enjoyed this conversation. I'm so grateful to the three of you for joining us because this was just marvelous. And I will tell you, um, all of you, that when I sat down, I don't even know how many months ago this was, it was a long time ago, when I sat down with a member of our festival committee who watched your film, he and I looked at each other and we said, that's that's going in. And you know, we, we weren't the only deciders, but it, we, we just immediately, I mean, it connected and I, I'm just so grateful to have um, just been present for this conversation. It just is, is, is marvelous. So thank you all for contributing so richly to it. And to those of you who are here in, in, in person, in the present and live, uh, thank you for being here as well. Uh, much appreciated. Um, well, thank you guys. Thank you also. Please send us your information because if we do um, produce other things as we produce them, we would love to send, you know, keep you on our list. Thank you. Um, very, very, you know, very much appreciated. Rosalyn and, and everybody, Casey, please send us your info. We'll, we'll definitely keep you in, uh, in the loop. Thanks so much for this opportunity and for getting behind our film. And um, um, yeah, I'm so grateful. We're so grateful that this is why we, we did it. To go back to the New Yorker question quickly, Daniel and I finished this at a time when we didn't know if there would be film festivals. So as we were doing the finishing touches and thinking, what are we gonna do? We looked in at online opportunities and the New Yorker was supporting documentary work. So we uh, submitted to them, they liked what we were doing, gave us some support um, so that we could uh, license uh, some clips and, and music and um, gave us some, some guidance. And then um, we debuted on their, uh, on the New Yorker, a video page, which was so exciting and um, and was the way that we thought we would meet the world. Um, but these intimate gatherings have proven to be um, uh, just incredibly valuable. Um, great to see all of your faces and thanks for the opportunity. It also feeds us and, and yeah. inspires us to continue doing the work. So thank you, thank you everybody, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Neil, I guess you close us out, don't you? Okay. Yeah, um, okay. I, I, I wish you all a, a lovely rest of your evening. And uh, yeah, I th thank you all again. Thanks for attending the festival, those who have. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.